Michael Render, a.k.a. Killer Mike, is a Grammy-winning hip-hop artist who's run the Jewels album RTJ4. First of all, it should have been nominated for a Grammy. And uh, you just heard a selection from it. Uh, he's also an activist who last year received Billboard's magazine first ever Changemaker Award. And I think he got it in part because of this impassioned speech that he did on the floor of the Atlanta City Hall following the murder of George Floyd. And the viral video of that has now been seen by almost 39 million people. So I would like to work, welcome my friend, Michael. I, I met you in 2015. Yes. First time you were on Real Time. Second time you were on Real Time, 2016. I came to your dressing room door and you had a cast on one arm. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, what's this? I said, are you in pain? And you said, well, I can't fight, but I can hug. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought to myself, here's a guy I want to work with someday. And yeah. My goal is for that to happen this year. So I want to be honest with people at the very beginning here that we're talking on January 8th. And we are in a time of reckoning in our country. Yes, we are resolving all sorts of things or trying to come to, to deal with them. A lot of them have their roots in America's original sin of slavery. Agreed. Since 1619, we've been reckoning with this sin. But we have this problem going back to 1619 where we had some structural issues in our house, some pre-existing structural issues that we didn't realize were there. Then yeah. we divided the house during the Civil War and we've yes. never quite gotten it back together again. And, and a huge member of the community was never invited into the, that's the, right. um, the, the party to put it back together. That's right. That's, a, that's exactly right. <laughs> and uh, what I think, what I always tell people is that you and I end every phone conversation by saying to each other, love and respect. Yes. Have, and a, have dope a dope day. day. Yes. And I think love and respect should be the northern star for us as yes. we try and make our way through this very disorienting time. I mean, we just, we just got through 2020 where the entire nation was, it was like we were in a timeout or we were under house arrest. How did you get through that? What's, what's the silver lining? Did you have, were there some things that you discovered that you didn't know were going to be there? Well, I've lived on a bus for the last eight years of my life, um, buses and planes and hotels. And, um, to put some context to it, I have a 26 year old son, a 23 year old daughter, an 18 year old son and a 13 year old daughter. So for most of their lives, I've been on the road. And um, no matter what spoils you get from your job, it, you miss your children and you miss your wife at home. You know, oftentimes my wife will come bust it with me, thankfully. But it, I, I had missed out on so much as being a father, not like paying the bills, not like being responsible and having to talk to make sure I keep in contact, but actually the father stuff The you know, the the, hey, man, she needs lunch. School isn't happening. You got to go have lunch. And her mother and I live in separate houses. At my house, you got to go have lunch with Michael. So I got a chance to really enjoy just being a regular dad with a, with a, you know, with a fancy job. And, and you said to me a couple of weeks ago that now whenever you make a big decision in your life, you're always factoring in the notion that someday you'll have grandchildren. Yes. You're yes. planning for them. Yeah, my, my mom, my mommy was 16 years old when she decided, well, she was 15 when she decided she was going to have a child. Her mother um, wasn't able to have a child until 28. My grandmother, to give you some context, was the granddaughter of an enslaved woman and the granddaughter on her father's side, the paternal side, of someone who was used in the Tuskegee experiment. Her family um, made enough money sharecropping um, and, and to buy their own land, which was a 20-some-acre farm in Tuskegee. We, that farm is still in our family today. So she worked incredibly hard to make sure that her children's children would have something. My grandfather, whose father abandoned him at 10 years old, did much the same. They kept a rental property even when they were married to make sure that they had enough to take us on vacations. So their every thought was on how to make me and my sisters comfortable enough so that we had an opportunity to take advantage of educations and whatever advantages we had. But also to make us independent human beings, to make sure that once we left their house, we wouldn't be in need of them and other people and we wouldn't have to suffer under the heel of other people simply to exist. And I find myself now as I grow into my 40s, 
It's like, that's what I want for my grandchildren. And for my grandparents, it was just simple stuff like buying stocks and bonds with Coca-Cola and Delta. It was simple stuff like making sure we had bank accounts. It was simple stuff like making sure we had the opportunity to um, engage in commerce, you know, ourselves early, encouraging us to do work, get jobs. For my grandkids, I want them to have the opportunity um, to have from the time they land on Earth, the stability they need to decide truly what they want to be. So it doesn't matter to me as much if they go to college or not. It matters to me that they're traveled and that they're truly educated. It matters to me that they have a skill or something that someone will want. And I know that when you don't have to worry about necessarily where you're going to live or where your next meal is coming from, it makes it easier. I know that spending time with my grandfather made me wiser. I know that spending time with my grandmother made me capable. Was there faith, if any, in your household growing up? What was it like? What was faith like in my household? Faith was like, we went to church, Sunday school at our Baptist church we belonged to at eight o'clock on Sundays. We then would leave our Sunday school. Um, you may or may not do a quick breakfast or something. And then you went to a holiness or a Pentecostal storefront church that my grandmother, I later realized we probably went to because of the music. My grandmother was raised Methodist. She went to a Baptist church and no criticism, but their music is cool, right? Yeah, yeah. But when you get to holiness and Pentecostal churches, yeah their music is absolutely jamming. The yeah. rhythm section is amazing in all of these churches. So we would spend the next four to six hours in church and it would be people prophesizing. It would be heavy prayer. It would be that, that deep, sweaty, Southern testimonial service that, that, that people um, stereotypically think about in the lower App Appalachian mountains of Tennessee with white folk and in the middle of Georgia with, with, with Black folks. It is truly church. So we would do that on Sundays. We would do revivals during the week. We would um, usually fast on Wednesdays. So very, very structured in spiritual household with my grandmother. My grandfather was a believer in God, but he was not a believer in giving your money to religious institutions. So, <laughs> often, <laughs> so oftentimes, you know, I would in particular as a boy just beg my grandmother to let me stay with my grandpa or to go fishing with him or something. So I didn't make every service, but I made more than more than um, more than not. And, and I think you and I are a little bit maybe like your grandfather in that or a combination here in that. Yeah. We've got a bunch of things in common. We have the same birthday. We do. <laughs> we're, both, we're April 20th. We're both asthmatics. Yeah. Yes, we are. <laughs> and and I think if I can, uh, you tell me if I'm wrong. We, we believe in God. We do. We love Jesus. Absolutely. And we have distrust of organized religion. A a absolute so, distrust. So, absolute so for instance, distrust. this church that the ceremony is in, which I love, I love coming to it, but I don't, I, I'm not a, an official member though I do give time and money. And uh, I don't call myself a Christian because so many people who call themselves Christians too loudly embarrass me and I don't yeah. want to be lumped in with them. But yeah. that doesn't stop me from following the scripture uh, of, of Jesus and, and, and to try and take it in and see how my life might be more like the way that he tells us we should live. Yeah, and you know, and, and from my stance, whether you are a Pan-Africanist that understands that many of the biblical stories are allegory taken out of comedic religion or Kushite, you know, folklore, even, you know, the, the um, story of Jesus aligns itself with the story of Isis and Horus. Um, if, if, whether, whether you are a, a person that believes in the, 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 the oldest churches of Ethiopia or where you're your person that believes in any of the prophets from Moses and the, and the Torah to, uh, to the prophet Muhammad in the Quran, um, Jesus is one of the most radical and revolutionary figures in any religion because of his adherence, not to law, not to his adherence to religious um, indoctrination or ceremony, but in his absolutely adherence to love for his fellow human being. I get chills thinking about it because it is such a monumental task to even attempt to love human beings in that way. There was one line in, I think it's Mark, book two, verse 26, where Jesus is talking. He says, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, he's doing some healing or he's helping somebody. And then these church officials come by and say, it's a Sunday, you shouldn't be doing that. And he goes, yeah. wait a minute, 
human beings aren't here to fulfill rules. Absolutely. Rules are being given to help human beings lead their best life. Absolutely. 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 Your your body needs a day to reset and rest. Oh, your I mind think, needs I, a I day to reflect. One of the, and, the great and, enemies and, of the internet. Yeah, no it, rest, no and, turn and off. Cell phones. Is there yes. is they have killed Sabbath. Yeah, they absolutely. My wife makes me eat you know, again. We're we're um we're we're non-practitioning religious people. My wife, I often joke, I say, you're a witch. Your intuition is so she has <laughs> like I don't she's one of those people that doesn't need the book. She has the direct connect to whatever put us here. So, you know, she doesn't let me work on Sundays, much like my grandmother. At six o'clock on Saturdays, radios and stuff would go off. It was you have to give the Lord some time. It was a famous phrase with my grandmothers. And um, so on my wife doesn't, she uses the Sunday like a Sabbath. I'm not allowed to work on Sundays. And communications is friendly, it's community, you know, it's com it's community. Our friends and loved ones come over. We often eat together and drink, but it is a time where she is like, this day is for my husband to relax, to de-stress. It's for him for being with family to recharge the next week. It is not for, you know, it is not for doing stuff. But if there's stuff to be done, mm -hmm. let it be right and just stuff. Mm -hmm. So she has allowed me many times in the past to do things, um, including but not limited to feeding the homeless and including but not limited to um, interviews and campaigns that will help. And I appreciate her for that because absolutely the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I remember you tell me one time about, I feel like, I feel like siestas are mini Sabbaths. Yes. And yet Europe. And I want to you thank told Europe. me. You told me one time about the first time that, that you guys toured Europe and this notion of in the middle of the day, everything's shutting down. Just shuts down. Just shuts down. My wife I think and I that is so around. wise. Um, it's wisdom. It's smart. It's, it's the right thing to do. Do you, have a, do you have a favorite quote from Jesus that helps you in your life? I do. I actually wrote it down. Look for it right here. It's um, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. And I love this quote because it is a command. It is not a suggestion. He said, a new command I give you. You know, we're used to the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. uh, but a new command, a command is an order. It is a demand. It is a directive. Um, Jesus was unflinching in that. Unflinching in love one another. Mm -hmm. Not unflinching in you must belong to this tribe or this, this, this social group of class, not unflinching in that you must follow these rules and must pray these many times a day, but unflinching is that you must love one another, not love according to the ceiling that you have on love or love according to the rules that you have. You must love one another as, as, as I have loved you, as I have loved you. And when people need context in terms of what Jesus says, well, I have loved you, Jesus in his crew, a guy named Paul, who was formerly Saul, was a Christian killer mm -hmm. on behalf of the state. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like, think about that. You know, and, and, and oftentimes I get in trouble because I try to understand situations from the totality of them. I try to get more perspectives because I don't, you know, I thought one of the most courageous things I've seen was Dick Gregory be so against the, the death penalty that he petitioned for a white supremacist not to be killed. Mm -hmm. That's loving one another as Jesus yep. has loved that's us. Right. That's and right. and that's, a, that's a love I am attempting to understand and enable myself to, because I'm not there, but it is a journey that, I, that I'm gladly on. You know, we sometimes just reduce Dr. King to, I have a dream. I would like you to tell me about what your thoughts are about that speech, but then also we just heard an excerpt by the wonderful Anna Devere Smith of yeah. letter from a Birmingham jail. And I would like you to talk about the two different kings that are expressed in those two different pieces of writing, both of which are eloquent. So I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. King is from Atlanta, Georgia. He was a middle-class child. Um, his parents were of means. His father was a minister, one of the most powerful churches in Atlanta, Ebenezer Baptist Church. He grew up amongst the black middle class and bourgeoisie. He had an opportunity to be as selfish and narcissistic as he wanted to be, and he chose not to. He chose, much like Christ, to sacrifice his life for the betterment of those that were um, that were the sick, the shut out, the downtrodden. And I don't just mean black people. You know, he was for the poor um, across the board. He many people know he celebrated for his "I Have a Dream" speech, and 
Dr. King's speech is used as propaganda in our schools, for television commercials, for our government. Um, but people don't know, and they probably should look at a documentary called King in the Wilderness. Mm-hmm. I was fortunate enough to be mentored by his direct lieutenants, people who work with him, Andrew Young, James Orange, Joseph Lowry. These men were my, are, you know, James, with Andy still being alive, are, um, with the other two, were my friends and mentors, John Lewis included. Um, so I got the real deal. And in the real deal, he died reviled. He died without a fortune. He died disdained by his former followers. Um, the bourgeoisie that had funded him now denied him. He chose the path of self-sacrifice um, for people who were oppressed in spite of all that. And that's a heavy burden to have to carry. And as a young man, to have done that at a time when he didn't have to always intrigued me. If you look at the king from I Have a Dream, it's aspirational. It's what is possible when we all decide to finally do it. It's, it's not as far as we want to believe. It's just around the corner if we make the right decision. But you don't get that joy of aspiration and that daring if you don't get the king that sits in a Birmingham jail cell alone and contemplates other ministers saying that you're causing too much trouble. Um, you need to you know, pull it back a little bit. It doesn't account for black business people that begin to take funding from. It doesn't account for um, Negro leaders that were against him speaking up. It doesn't account for the white liberal who say, hold on, maybe you went too far with this one, Martin, and pulling their allyship back. And that Dr. King is a lot more challenging to get your head around because that Dr. King is a man that is not perfect. He is a man that is flawed. He is as human as you and I was. He had all the instincts that we did, and he repeatedly chose to go further and further down a course that would eventually lead up to a bullet in his chest and him dying in in Memphis, Tennessee, because he was he was doing work on the behalf of the unions. No matter your color, if you remember the union, he was doing work on the behalf of poor people. No matter your color, race, ethnic origin, it was for poor people. That is a Christ like methodology um, in a way that you don't see today on national scale in the way that it deserves to be, um, with the exception of a few ministers out there. He also was coming out strongly against the Vietnam War. Yes, that got him a lot of trouble. Johnson's War, and he needed Johnson for legislation. Yes. But he also knew at a time when we had a draft, it was was the young Black people who were were going to be going and not being able to find uh, deferments. I feel like the Birmingham jail was like his Gethsemane. Wow. Did it surprise you? You mentioned being from Atlanta, Georgia, and you just had a triumphant Senate race that you helped elect uh, two Democrats, including the present minister of Ebenezer Baptist Church, where where King presided uh, for many, many years. Do you think the victories that you helped achieve in Georgia, can this be replicated in other states in the South? Yes, it, it absolutely can. 55% of African Americans already live in the South. I think I read an article today, and I forgot who wrote it. I'm sorry, I can't mention it, but it talks about a reverse great migration. There needs to be a migration back to the South, and it needs to be it needs to be African Americans. You need to come home. A lot of you guys are in New York, Philadelphia. A lot of you guys are out west. You guys have land already at home. You got cousins in Philadelphia signing off on land sales that have never been in Louisiana. You have four or five hundred acres. You should come home. You should come home. You should come home. You should come home. You have political power here. There's economic opportunity here. You have the power to plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize in Birmingham, Charlotte, Tampa, Jacksonville, Columbia, um, New Orleans, Louisiana, Homer, you know, Houston, Texas, Dallas. And if we do that, and if we create strong communities, um, what we start to do is we start to not only strengthen ourselves as a community, it strengthens the greater community as well. So I want to encourage people to take a migration and come home. There's another way that you're addressing uh, and helping people. You mentioned Andrew Young a little while ago. You yes. and Andy Young, who was a colleague of King's. Yes. You have partnered on a bank. Yeah, banking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So tell me about that. But you got to promise me you're never going to become a mean banker. No, 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 I'm not. I'm not going to do that. I um, 
All right, so my grandparents thought it important that me and my sister think black, right? We, yeah. you know, we did not like we black people, you know, have only been out of apartheid in this country. You know, Jim Crow sounds cute, sounds like you're talking about the Animaniacs or something, but Jim Crow was apartheid. We're only 57 years out of apartheid, which means my parents were born in apartheid. So I didn't understand why my grandparents were adamant about having a blank account, black bank account. They were adamant about our pediatrician being black. They were adamant about identity. It was just certain things you were just like, this man, like, is everything black? Why do we have to go to this Exxon? But what we didn't understand was we had been excluded from resources so much that much like she told my daughter, be independent. Don't even depend on your drunk daddy on the sofa. I, 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 the, the country called America is the drunk daddy on the sofa for black folks. And we, we need to make sure that we have a, a level of independence. And what, what I mean is corporations not only took grocery stores out of black communities, they took banking institutions out of black communities. Mm -hmm. So the same way you would used to go get fresh produce, fresh meats, canned goods, and able to fix a sensible dinner that kept you and your, your, your family healthy. Now you were going to whatever dollar store you could afford or whatever corner store you're getting stuff to, with plastic wrappers, all types of additives that were bad for you. And you saw the results of that, right? Um, taking banking institutions out of our communities did the same thing. We were left with check cash in places. Um, liquor stores, buy here, pay here, title lenders. Andy went to India and saw how a card that they were giving out that would be comparable to a um, to a debit card of sorts. It didn't have extra fees and things attached to it. It allowed women who say wanted to save yarn or, or, or make silk things, they could save extra money. They weren't being robbed or extorted with a percentage for cash to check. <laughs> Excuse me, for cash to check. His son, Bo, Ryan Glover, Paul Judge, and he um, invited me into the circle of founders to be a part of starting the banking platform that acts like a PayPal or like a Chime, but actually has the banking incentives where it partners with black banks and other larger banks to give people who are unbanked actual accounts. And I just thought that was an amazing thing to do. I've been pushing the line for black banking for over six years. I'd never been offered an opportunity to partner with a bank, nor had I sought or asked one. When I could have sat down with banks and say, I'm going to promise you these many thousands of accounts. I'm going to take this much off accounts. I never took that advantage. I never did that because my intentions were always to simply get us on the path that my grandparents put me on the path of independence. However, I'm a businessman and I'm not crazy. So when I got an opportunity to sit down and see how this would help my community, this was a good service and product for them. And I could on, get in on the ground floor and be a founder, sit on the board and actually learn business as I go. I took advantage of that. And I am proud to be a founder of Greenwood. I'm proud to later this year be bringing a product that I think is going to help the unbanked, help in particular black and Latino people in poor and working class neighborhoods. And I think it adds something new to the market that makes the market more competitive. And I can tell you, for instance, um, when we did black banking six years ago, Wells Fargo found $60 million for black mortgages, not for people of color mortgages, not for disenfranchised people, not for, for black mortgages. And within us announcing Greenwood um, and pushing the black banking campaign more, I've seen um, a major bank that I do business with, Chase, pick up people like Kevin Hart, pick up people like Serena Williams. I've seen Chime use 21 Savage. So to me, no matter where you go, as long as you have people there representing us in front of and behind that camera, getting the opportunity to um, be a part of the banking system, I think that is for the better. You have said to me, and I accept this premise, that Black Americans are owed a debt. Yes. And I think what a lot of white Americans want to know or want help with yes. is how is that achieved? Well, before I give you what, what I think we should do, let's do this. Let's agree that 1619 and the bringing of the first enslaved Africans here are the cornerstone to the wealth that this country was built on. And you just, you don't get America without an explosion of cotton and tobacco. You just don't. It yeah. does, you don't get rich. You don't get rich quick without doing something illegal. That was true if you're Joe Kennedy or Prescott Bush, right? Yeah. So yeah. as a nation, it doesn't, you don't. You let, don't let, me just add, let me just interrupt you for one second to say, 
as I was watching videos of those hooligans storming the Capitol, <laughs> I heard one of these white guys say, this is ours. We built it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, you, no, you didn't. Like, like in the literal Benjamin <laughs> Banneker remembered the layout of the city after the French guy left. After the guy was like, Foutoir, I am gone. Like it was that. And then when it was burnt down, we built it back and we built the first. <laughs> so it's like, so, so I, I, and Baldwin always encourages a black and white Americans to understand we have a shared history. And in that shared history, right, there is there, not the black history, the white history, the shared American history. We have been wrong. And not wrong like, oh, you slapped us, that was wrong. Not wrong like we used it for a few hundred years, that was wrong. Wrong like we have never been given full opportunity to partake in this grand experiment called America. And because of that, I believe this country, as great it is, as it is, still is fundamentally behind where it could possibly be. Black people gave you the stoplight, the gas mask, refrigerated trucks, um, the self-oiling um, railroad thing, the monkey wrench, like so many things that corporations make billions of were started in the minds of the people who had to do the work. I would argue the cotton gin was not invented by a white guy. Why? Because he wasn't picking cotton. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Um, I think that we owe John Connor, God bless the dead, John Connor, we owe him a real push at H.R. 40, which is a bill that would study what reparations are due to the people who've been denied the opportunity to fully participate in America. If we're only 57 years free, what were we denied by redlining in Chicago and places like that? What were we denied in the opportunity when the suburbs were built? There were literally um, land grant agreements that said black people could not move to the suburbs, right? It, what were we denied in being denied the GI Bill? What were we denied by being used as sharecroppers and not to mention slavery? So I think that this country has an amends to make. And by making that amend in terms of monetary, in terms of land ownership, in terms of education, higher education and trade, in terms of um, freedom from taxation for a number of years that would allow you to actually build business and be competitive in a capitalistic system. I think we're owed an array of those things, but I think first and foremost, we're owed that legislation that Connors had been fighting for since 89. If we atone for our original sin, if we atone for that sin, then I guarantee you we come out a more glorious and greater nation in the name of God than we have ever been before. But you must testify. Like that's yes. what I learned in those small churches. You have to, you have to give it up to God. You have to release it. And enough of the nationalistic religion of white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism that says, well, everything is okay and fair now because everything can't be okay and fair because you've not confessed your sins to Christ. As we conclude here, the choir is now going to sing a song that I know has particular resonance for you. And that is Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. Can you tell yes. us what meaning that has for you? My grandmother and grandfather raised me. My grandmother, Betty Clunt, again, was the granddaughter of an enslaved woman um, named Pearlie Mackey. Her mother, Tuzella um, Blackman, lived till I was 10, taught me how to sew a button on. My grandmother was one of the most deeply spiritual human beings that I met. She had, she had been a very mean young woman. <laughs> she had been a fighter and feisty. There was a legend in her family she preferred working in the fields in the kitchen. And that's when I understand how truly she must have loved me that she cooked because she detested the kitchen as a girl. She was a tomboy. Mm. But my grandmother um, died in my arms, walking up a hill. She looked at me, she looked up past me, and she was gone. And that probably affirmed my belief that there is something beyond this more than anything else. Because at one point, I just didn't even know if there was anything beyond this. I didn't know if we were anything more than animals with clothes on that thought more of ourselves because we felt we could communicate on a higher level. But in that moment, my assurance and faith that whatever she had been trying to teach me through religion, whatever that being was, absolutely existed because I saw it in her eyes. She looked at me, who she loved and adored. She looked past my shoulder. She smiled as though she was accepting an invitation. She put her arms around me and she fell there. And my thoughts as she lay there, gone, because it was in an instant with her and as people were coming up, I was telling them to get the ambulance or whatever. Um, 
the 23rd Psalms talks about laying down next to still waters. I thought about that because she was laying in grass. And this record, you know, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, coming for the Take Me Home. She sang that so much in my life that I knew one day she was going to leave, but I didn't know it was going to be like that. And my sister said she died happy because she died with you. You were her favorite person. And I often listen to this record by myself and I cry because I think of her and I know that wherever she went, she's happy. I know that she knew after our final conversation, her job at raising an independent man was done. And I knew that it was time for her to go home. And I hope that whenever, whenever I am called to go home, that it is in a peaceful way as she was. And I hope that this is the song that plays whenever I meet her on the other side. Michael, yes. love and respect to you. L love and respect. And have and a dope have, day. Have a dope day. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Love and respect. Thank you guys so much.